Hello everyone, how's everybody doing today? I hope you're doing fine. I'm still drinking my mate. Um, someone put a comment that some um, uh, some of the comments have been deleted to comments. First of all, I don't delete comments, okay? Just want to make sure that's, that's clear. Uh, the other thing is that, um, you know, YouTube has apparently some kind of thing there where they send a lot of my comment, a lot of the comments that you folks put, they put them as spam. Even though I, I said, you know, allow all comments, it still does it. So I don't know what to do about it. But uh, so the, the big problem is really for me because I go in there manually, you know, unspam them. And I don't delete comments. Uh, you know, you, you can cuss my mother if you want here. I mean, it doesn't matter to me, really. So I don't mess around with comments, first thing. Um, I wanted to mention two things before I get into the topic today. The first one is that, you know, like three or four people <laughs> have accused me of being a disinformation agent. Woo! <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I, I feel good now. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, um, they, they think uh, someone's, that I'm on someone's payroll or something. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I just want you to know, uh, uh, I'm 66 year old, 66 years old. I'm going at 90, you know, uh, you know, I, I probably won't live till the age of 70. I don't know. Maybe I'll live five or six more years. That's, that's my best guess. You know, I'm, I'm in pretty bad shape. I got, I had several operations, primarily micro operations with bones, that kind of thing. I have arthritis, but you know, my health is not the best in the world. You know, I drink beer, I drink wine, so I can't be too healthy. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I'm a retired uh, person. I, I have, uh, I do this for fun, only for hobby, you know, so um, am I on someone's payroll? Well, you know, uh, a lot of people get this because, you know, I, um, one time, you know, I worked with the CIA, I worked with the FBI, I worked with uh, the Cuban Intelligence Service, with uh, KGB, with the Slovak, Iran, and so on. And, uh, and so people say, oh, he must have ties to intelligence. You know, that, that was in the 90s, early 90s, okay? That's over with, never again, okay? Uh, I'm just stating that. Uh, those of you who know a little bit about me, probably seen uh, maybe the movie. Here's, here's the movie that went out, Crazy Che. Okay, you can find it on uh, Netflix, okay? So, uh, or if you look me up on the internet, you'll, you'll probably find, uh, uh, you know, a lot of information with me related to intelligence. Uh, I put that out, out there on the board right now so that people don't think I'm hiding something, you know? Yeah, I had ties to intelligence. That was a long time ago. And that was politics. That, you know, you can, yeah, all politics, really, in the end. And uh, that's over with. Uh, right now I'm doing physics, and uh, you have to judge that simply by what I put online. I'm putting a mechanism for you to understand uh, what could be disinformation about that, okay? So, uh, you know, maybe if, if I do something fancy with politics and say vote for this guy instead of for that one, then you can say something. But to present a mechanism and you accusing me of being a disinformation agent, my God. You know, I think uh, this um, conspiracy, conspiracy thing has really gotten out of hand. People are th overthinking things too much. But, you know, if, uh, if you want to believe, I, I can't help you. And uh, maybe it's in my favor, you know, because that way if, if you do something wrong, like, you know, put something wrong, well, you never know. I'll call my buddies over there in Washington and they'll send a satellite and, you know, maybe zap you with a drone. So you better keep, be careful with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the first one that I, I just wanted to clear up there. The other one is, uh, what was the, the other one? Uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, I said last time that, uh, you know, some of these people, uh, they go into Patreon and they have funds coming in and they're building these pyramids, right? And so a couple people came back and said, well, you know, Bill, uh, yeah, we're all doing the same thing. You're doing the same thing, too. You know, it's like the uh, bum on the street. He's got a little cup, tin cup. So he does something, maybe he does a song and dance. And if you like it, well, you give him some pocket change, right? And that's more or less 
what Patreon is about. And I'm saying, no, it's not exactly the same thing. Where is the difference? The difference is that, you know, I'm the bum on the street with a little cup. That's me. It's not these other guys. See, these guys are forming organizations. They've taken over the whole city, and they're controlling all the bums on the street and collecting from each one of them. That's a different story. They're building a pyramid, okay? So it's, it's a little different than what I do. I'm a little bum. Look, look you look at my numbers. Uh, we started uh, this channel about a year and a half ago. I've got 300 plus uh, followers. That's that's all. And on my regular channel, I've been there for 10 years. I only got I got slightly less than 5,000 people. If if I'm running by the CIA or <laughs> well one of these organizations, believe me, I'd be a lot more successful. You know, I'd be all over the place. Uh, Rupert Murdoch would be interviewing me. Okay, it, it would be a little bit different. And uh, so, yeah, I'm not a disinformation agent and I'm a little guy on the street with a little tin cup. These other guys, you know, look at the Electric Universe. That's an organization. Uh, John Chappelle, I call him the John Chapel Society because they do religion with ether. Um, and what do they do? Uh, they built an organization. Okay, uh, Flat Earthers, they built an organization. They're doing something a little different. They're building an empire, okay? So if you're going to suspect of someone disinforming the public, I, I don't think it's the Electric Universe or, or, or the John Chapel says, I'll be honest with you. But uh, Flat Earthers, you know, these people complain about conspiracies. I think it's easier to believe that they're, uh, you know, set up by the government. It's easier to believe that. I mean, if we're going to talk about conspiracies, I'd rather believe that and not that, uh, you know, that the government's infiltrated them or doing something to them. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's the context. Another thing I want to mention is, uh, someone clarified for me, uh, in Argentina, they have, uh, this flat earth society, but it's not called the flat earth. See, they have all these little splinter groups. <laughs> uh, they're called the planar or the plain uh, earth, the plain earth society. Okay. Uh, tierra plana <laughs> and uh, so yeah and so they say they don't have the same gravity uh, mechanism for gravity that uh, the um, uh, that the flat earth has in fact they say that they believe flat earth is taken over by religious people etc etc and that they're really more a scientific group <laughs> okay uh, let's see. Yeah, 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 I'm a disinfo agent, so just be aware. You better watch out for me. I'll call the boys over there in Washington and do some harm to you. So you better treat me nice, okay? <laughs> okay, so let's get on with it. Today I'm going to be talking about a gentleman. His name is, uh, well, his moniker is uh, Professor Dave. And I came ac uh, across him because uh, I was getting uh, ready last time. I wanted to get some... Um, some info out there to see what I could use. And I came across him and I mistook him originally for another fellow. So if I use the wrong moniker, don't blame me. Uh, there's a Dr. Dave and we had a long discussion with Dr. Dave some years ago. And I thought it was the same Dr. Dave and no, this is a different fellow. And he criticized the uh, flat earthers, okay? And uh, so I went in there and looked at it, and I think he did a pretty good job. <laughs> uh, pretty good job, yeah. And uh, I like some of the things uh, uh, Professor uh, Dave said, okay? And I want to discuss a couple of them today uh, because it attacks the, at least the official Flat Earth Society. Please don't hang me if, I, if you're not part of it. You know, maybe you're a Flat Earther from the other side of the Flat Earth from Antarctica, I don't know, but... I'm going to focus it from the same point that he did, and uh, that is the mainstream flat earthers. Okay, let's keep that in mind. That, that's the way we've got to do it because we, we can't look at all the splinter groups and what each one thinks and believes and so on. It's just too much. You know, uh, I don't know how many flat earth societies there are out there. Okay, I really don't. And yeah, I haven't investigated them fully. Maybe someone's got a different uh, mechanism for gravity. In fact, uh, they pointed out that uh, the one in Argentina is uh, done with um, density. 
and buoyancy. Uh, they're, they're looking at Archimedes, okay? And so they claim that they don't have this, uh, the one that I explained the other day about having all this dark energy or dark matter or whatever pushing the earth from below, okay? They have a different mechanism. Okay, fine. Um, I personally, I think it's irrelevant because flat is flat is flat. And the big problem, the starting point is they have to define the word flat. I need to know what they mean by flat. If flat is uh, what I think it is, or the way I define it, because it's the uh, really a scientific version, flat is not what even mathematical physics calls flat, which they think it's something that's level or that has a, a smooth surface. No, flat means zero thickness. That's what flat means, okay? That's what it means in physics, for the purposes of physics. So if you have zero thickness, I need to know uh, either with that definition or even the uh, formal definition of smooth surface, you know, how, how are you going to put Mount Everest in there? How flat is flat? I mean, what do you mean uh, flat? Is it a, like a pancake? How thick, how, how thick is it, the pan your pancake? We need to know, and we need a, a perfect, unambiguous definition of the word flat before you talk about the flat earth, okay? So that's my point. But let me go on with uh, what the, uh, Dr. See, I, I'm going to say Dr. Dave. What Professor Dave said about some of these guys, okay? So this is, these were some of his arguments. I'll just go through them real quickly because I want to get to the second half um, of today's presentation. And uh, he said, uh, he, he he's essentially said, you know, that um, he had some valid questions for him. He analyzed their seasons and he analyzed their day and night. And he found inconsistencies there, something that was at least not clear to him. And I join him in his criticism there, okay? Uh, we got to be uh, straightforward with these things. Guy tells uh, what it is, you got to accept it for what it is. And I think he did a good job there, okay? That's my honest opinion. And by the way, uh, you can look at his video. It's in, my, uh, in the description of this video. Right at the bottom, you'll see uh, the link to uh, Professor Dave's uh, site if you want to look at the video. He took like 45 minutes to analyze it. I think he did a pretty good job in general, okay? Okay, my comments are a little darker there. Uh, sun and moon, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, everything is spherical out there running around Mars and everything, and the only thing in the universe that is flat is our Eden. Our blue Eden. I mean, it, 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 it's already counterintuitive, you know. That, that's one issue. Sun and moon are the same size, or more or less the same size. You know, it's it's breathtaking. <laughs> 21st century, it's, it's breathtaking, believe me. Uh, what causes the sun and the moon to orbit around the perimeter of the Earth? That's one question I've got. I mean, what's put, if, if we're going to go with the official version, you know, the sun and the moon going around, I don't know if there's another theory out there, but I'm just going to go with that one. What pushes the Earth? I mean, these guys don't believe in gravity, okay? And even the density guys, the guys that say that's buoyancy, okay, fine. What moves the Earth and the sun around? I need to know what pushes against the skin of the sun and against the skin of the moon. I need to know that. I, you need to tell me what physical object is there, okay? I need to see that. And, uh, I mean, if you're not going to use gravity, and in the case of the mainstreamers of Flatman, uh, yeah, uh, I need to see uh, what physical object you're going to be moving this around with. Um, I like uh, doc, uh, doctor, Professor Dave's uh, analysis of throwing the ball on the truck. Uh, and I, th I think it's a it's a good point. Uh, he's saying, you know, if you're on the ground throwing a ball to your friend back and forth, it's the same thing as if you were on the truck throwing back and forth uh, the ball because you're in a, you're in a frame of reference, and you don't have to understand it in, in great detail and go into math and find out what a frame of reference is for the purpose of general relativity or anything like that. Uh, just just do it. Uh, you know, get on the ground, throw the ball to each other, and then get on the truck, and you'll see what a frame of reference is. It means that. You know, uh, nothing changes because of the truck is moving. You're moving with it, and so is the ball. Everything, you know, is, is uh, with, uh, with momentum, okay? Everything's moving. And so, uh, you know, uh, I think they, the, these people have a lot of problems applying that concept to a lot of their arguments. You know, they, they use arguments that seem to violate that. Okay. And again, I'm not going to go in detail on that, but go, go to um, Professor Dave's uh, site 
and uh, his video, and he explains that in a little more detail. He's not the only guy, there's, there's other people out there that do that. And uh, you'll get an idea that there's some kind of problem with the flat earthers uh, with respect to this notion of what it is to have, you know, momentum. I pulled out a comment made by the flat earthers, that's in red down there, and uh, I want to clarify something about that, that I thought needed clarification, because uh, there are different versions out there, and uh, I think 99% of the people out there get it wrong, okay, so let me clarify this, it says the whole nonsense about Eratosthenes measuring that the earth was a sphere, blah, 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 and it took uh, 1800 years to rediscover it or whatever, well, first of all, it's a lousy argument, Okay. It's a nonsense argument to say, well, we used to, you know, you're saying we used to know that the earth was round 2,000 years ago, and now and it took 2,000 years to reinvent it. You know, even if, if that were true, which probably is to some degree, uh, that's not the argument. Okay. That's not the argument. But there's a, a bigger problem here, and that's the one I wanted to address, and that's that... Uh, the part where he says, measuring that the earth was a sphere. You know, a lot of people have this idea that Eratosthenes proved or somehow demonstrated that the earth was round. This is not true, okay? Now, in order to show you why it's not true, uh, I did a little experiment. It's a very expensive experiment, okay? And, um, and you want to do it in the presence of a certified relativist because it's a very dangerous experiment, okay? took a flat surface, and what I did was this. Let me show you what I, what I did, okay? <clears throat> Where is it? Um, here it is. And I put two little pens on it, okay? I made with uh, two uh, clothespins, made sure they were more or less straight, and I started shining a light directly on one of the pens. Okay, now this is a flat surface, and you can see that there is a shadow on the second pen, on the one that doesn't have the light directly on it. Now, if I shine the light on the first one and we get a shadow on the second one, does that mean the table is curved? Obviously, you can get the same result. You can get a shadow, okay, even on a flat plane, okay? What is the issue? The issue is that Eratosthenes assumed, and here we'll show you this, I think it's this one, um, Eratosthenes assumed a spherical earth and parallel rays from the sun. He did not prove it, he assumed it. Based on that assuming with a good hunch, and good intuition, he said, if the earth is curved, I can figure out the angle and figure out, you know, uh, first that the, uh, what the curvature of the earth is, which means he can figure out what the circumference is. And then he had more or less a good idea of how far away the sun is as well. He could get a, a approximation, a ballpark figure, okay? But the important things that I'm trying to say here is he did not prove the earth was round. It, it was an assumption. He had to assume also parallel rays, okay? So let, let's keep those in mind. Uh, people, most people get those two things wrong, okay? They think that Eratosthenes proved it. Okay, um, these were a couple of the uh, um, uh, arguments that Professor Dave uh, raised. I want to show these, okay? And he showed that, you know, you cannot have this uh, flat earth, as the flat earthers uh, proposed, okay? And here, let's start here. He's saying, look, uh, uh, what these guys are saying that uh, you have all these uh, concentric circles, and in winter, you're farther away from the North Pole, and in summer, you're closer away, uh, closer to it, okay? So, um, so, so uh, the question is uh, that uh, Professor Dave uh, raises, he says, you know, there is no indication that the sun either travels faster in one part of the year or that it is closer or farther away from the North Pole or any of that. So he's got a valid issue, I think, here, and I don't know how they're going to answer that, okay? Um, this is something that 
you know, again, it, it goes into what these people are saying. You know, it says it takes less time uh, on the outer and inside it's faster, etc. You know, so so they this is something he's right about. You know, he, he as far as I'm concerned, I don't know how they're going to explain this. The other thing is you got a co uh, contradiction there between the two models that they present. One they present for day and night, the other one for the season and the the um, uh, the um, maps that they put they don't match. And so, you know, I think these are corrections that uh, those who work on flat earth, at least uh, they have something to work on if they want to answer those questions, you know. Uh, here's another one. This is the day and night one, okay. Um, and the eclipse one. Here's the eclipse. Uh, moon and sun are on the opposite sides. This is a third one. <laughs> the sun uh, is a certain distance from the, uh, from the earth. So uh, the question is, uh, you know, when we get higher on the um, uh, in the atmosphere, like you send, we I mean, go on a balloon or whatever. Uh, why, do, why does it get hotter? I mean, if we're if the sun is that close to us, you know. And and here's uh, you know the moon and sun on opposite sides. You know the way you have to explain the eclipse here. The moon has to go under the sun. Keep that in mind because we're you know it's a flat Earth. We're looking up. The moon has to go under the sun. And then yeah, you have to uh, show me you know what the um, what the trajectories of these two are. And this is the other one, the day and night. Light takes more time to go to the center than to go to the edges here, okay? And so the issues, how do you produce that straight line that divides day from night in, on the earth? So all these, I think, are valid issues that Professor Dave raises. And, uh, you know, you can't take a penny away from that. I think these are valid issues that have to be addressed, okay? So watch his video and you'll get an idea about it. Okay, uh, where do I see problems? Well, I see problems uh, in the arguments raised by the flat earthers, which were just as good, and they relate all to gravity, okay? And so I wanna go with that next. And he here's a question that uh, they asked uh, Professor uh, Dave, okay? And it's got to do with uh, mathematical physics, obviously. Gravity is neither caused by mass attracting mass, nor is it caused by space and time bending in the pockets and then having things fall into it. Okay, good question or a good uh, attack. What does Professor Dave say? Yes, gravity is both those things. All mass warps space time, therefore all mass attracts all other mass. If you can't understand that, that's not my problem. Well, really no one can understand that, even, Do even Professor Dave, okay? Uh, he's uh, mixing mathematics with physics. Physics is one thing, mathematics is another. When he talks about mass, we got 100 kilograms weighing down space-time, whatever space-time is, okay? And then you have another scenario here where mass attracts mass. Well, mass cannot attract mass in physics. Maybe you can say that in mathematics, but you cannot say that 100 kilograms attracts 200 kilograms, not in physics. You can say that a, a cube attracts a sphere. You can say something like that. You can say that an elephant attracts an ant, but you cannot say 100 kilograms attracts 200 kilograms or weighs down space time. So he used a statement of authority. He did not explain that. I mean, it would have been nice if he could explain the mechanism, okay? Uh, that's one issue. Uh, the... Um, Here's another uh, issue related to that, and that's that, you know, mass has never been defined by science, okay? Today we have up to seven definitions according to the Wikipedia of what mass is. In special relativity alone, we have two of them, uh, two kinds of mass. We have a rest mass and the invariant mass and the relativistic mass, okay? And then Edwin Taylor and John Wheeler, especially John Wheeler, he's a very renowned guy. He died uh, some time ago now. Uh, he says, and they say in their book, right, space-time physics, nature does not offer us any concept as the amount of matter. History has struck down every proposal to define such a term, even if we could count number of atoms or by any other counting method try to evaluate amount of matter, that number would not equal mass, which is exactly what we're taught in uh, high school. We, we're saying, you know, it's the quantity of matter. No, it ain't. Okay, so we don't have a definition of the word mass. No one has any idea what mass is. Uh, and um, the interesting part is when they apply that to a black hole, which is the scenario on the right, uh, you have a couple of professors saying that <clears throat> the black hole crushes matter out of existence. So we have this, and uh, by the way, um, uh, who is it? Uh, Chandra Sekhar's uh, um, Nobel Prize, they gave him that for saying the same thing, by the way. Okay, so the, this is this has a lot of authority behind it. 
That's the point. And here we have a circular argument because we have a black hole is made of mass because what does a black hole have? Well, aside from, uh, you know, uh, charge and some a couple of uh, two two properties that has uh, which not all um, black holes have all black holes have mass. That's that's the official version. And uh, if mass is the quantity of matter as it's defined uh, in high school and just about to about to everybody and a black hole. Uh, crushes all matter out of existence, and we have no mass because that's the definition of matter: quantity of, uh, of mass, quantity of matter. So we have a problem where a black hole. We have a circular argument where black hole crushes matter out of existence. Ma uh, mass is the quantity of matter, and there is no matter in there. So uh, what is a black hole? What do we have? Okay. So uh, these are questions that uh, you know these people need to address, uh, and, and I'm talking about the establishment here. And uh, here's a, a thing that I put, a little video that I put uh, a couple weeks ago, and that's a turtle going around, you know, space time. So what is it going around? Well, it's going around mass, a concept. And they build this uh, fishnet that, to give you some, uh, some pictorial representation of what they're talking about. And you're saying, hold it, we have a turtle going around two concepts. First, it's going around mass, which is a concept, an undefined concept, by the way. And then they turn this mass, they say, well, it weighs down space time. Well, what is space time? Well, space time is this fishnet that they draw, okay? And they say, well, you're not supposed to take the uh, uh, analogy too literally. Well, so far, all I have is a turtle going around two concepts because if the fishnet is a concept, it's uh, space time, which is a concept, mass is a concept. What is the, what is uh, compelling? the turtle physically to go around and around in circles. Okay, that's the issue. That's what they have to solve. And, uh, and um, you can't escape that issue because this is the situation here. Okay, and look at this uh, real carefully. Uh, here we have the sun weighing down the fishnet of space time. Okay, so uh, why doesn't the earth fly out of the solar system? Well, because it's trapped in the gravity well formed by the depression caused by the sun in space time. That's the official version. That's the physical interpretation for why the earth doesn't fly out of the solar system. So I built the wall there just to illustrate it. Uh, there's a wall and, and the earth can't go beyond that wall. That's why it's going around in circles. Well, why can the moon go through that wall? Why can a, a, a what is it, a, a comet go through that wall? Why can an asteroid go through that wall and not the earth? Why can, um, uh, you know, the um, astronauts go through that wall. Why can rockets go to uh, Mars through that wall? Why can everything go that, through that wall except the Earth? So we got a problem in the physical interpretation. That's what I'm talking about, okay? I'm talking about not math. You know, they can describe anything they want with math. I don't care. I'm saying the physical interpretation is irrational, okay? So they cannot say that, look, we our math represents the real physical world out there. That's baloney, okay? Uh, and so, yeah, um, uh, that's where uh, Professor um, Dave had a problem answering that question. Nobody can answer that, not even him. All I'm saying is he should stay within math and not go into physics and pretend that the math represents the real world. It doesn't. It describes it. It does not explain it. Okay, let's keep that straight. They don't have a physical interpretation, okay? And here's another issue that was raised um, uh, by the flat earthers. All these were pretty good questions or issues raised by the flat earthers, by the way. Uh, it shows they're not completely crazy, at least <laughs> not totally, okay? Okay, it doesn't mean you have to be a flat earther, but uh, their, their issue, the issues they raised were valid. And uh, so here's a, that's the sound of a man with a worldview who is refusing to go by observations instead uh, would rather make something up like expanding universe that exploded from nothing at the Big Bang. And yeah, a lot of people have problems with this because this is creationism. Everybody identifies this as creationism, except the people who defend it, okay? They don't like uh, to be considered creationist because that puts them, uh, you know, in the, in the, uh, what is it, in the um, fundamentalist camp, 
fundamentalist Christian camp. And so what does Professor Dave answer? He says, yeah, sounds pretty zany, but the Big Bang cosmological model is very well substantiated by empirical evidence. Whoa, recession velocities of the galaxy suggest a particular age for the universe and the detection of the cosmic background radiation that originated in the recombination era corroborates that age. All he's doing is throwing authority at you. That's all we have here, okay? That's all, that's all we're seeing. Uh, you know what they what they try to do in these uh, instances let me tell you what the what the trick is okay and this is important for you to understand about the big bang the official version now or, or the way it's drifting for the majority of these people uh, when they talk to the public they say yeah the big bang you know it started off from nothing time began they give you all this uh, rigmarole okay but when you go in there and you start asking questions they say oh they hold it hold it the equations stop one gazillions of a second right after the Big Bang, right after the singularity. See, we don't know what happened just that billions of seconds before that. The laws of physics break down at that point. <laughs> that, that's the answer you get. You say, hold, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. You're saying, uh, we, we, how did we deduce this? We, we, took the, we rewound the movie backwards, right? We took the tape back to the beginning. So we said, look, all the galaxies are expanding. That's the official version. Under the rope model, that's not true, but we'll concede. So all the galaxies are running away from each other. We run the movie backwards, and everything got closer and closer together, and we get all the way to that point where we get to the singularity. But they start, they don't stop at t equals zero. They go at t equals one. <laughs> They start at a positive value, and they say, what happened before that? Well, we don't know. We, uh, science doesn't reach that far. You know, it's, it's beyond the, uh, the scientific method because we have no way of proving that. So what are you left with? You're left with this notion that you're supposed to fill in the blanks. We're just going to take it to T plus 1. Now, if you want to take it to T plus zero and believe that God created the singularity or whatever, well, that's your prerogative. All we can tell you what science tells us, and that's that we go down to T plus one. That's not that's a cop out because they, all they have to do is take the movie a little farther back. And it's a logical consequence that you're going to end up with zero. OK, that's what they're saying. They're saying that uh, matter started from nothing. In fact, uh, you have Stephen Hawking. In his book, A Brief History of Time, telling you, I should have put that today, but telling you that it all came from energy. You have plus energy, negative energy, you know, you put them together and you have, what? <laughs> you have no energy, you know, because they, they cancel out mathematically. And then you separate no energy into plus and negative energy, and suddenly you have, you know, positive uh, and negative energy. One is uh, gravity and the other one's mass. That's the explanation. So that's creation from nothing. What is energy? Well, it's a concept. Nobody knows because like uh, I showed last week, uh, Richard Feynman says it clearly. Uh, we have no idea what energy is. Okay, so uh, if they don't know what energy is, they can't use the word. They can't say energy did this, energy did that, because that's all they're saying is the spirit did this. They're using the word energy in lieu of the word spirit. That's all they're doing. Okay. So no, um, uh, no answer there. It's all authority. That's all he threw it uh, at the um, flat earthers. How about dark matter? This one I like. Here's dark matter. Okay. And the uh, flat earthers asked him, uh, you know, there are no direct measurements of dark matter. And then they say at the end, he's saying that there is uh, direct evidence. Okay. And Professor Dave says, in actually, the people that know, I love that word, know, they, they always know, they always predict, right? They, they know everything. That dark matter is there and are trying to figure out what it is, write papers that look like this. And he shows that picture on the upper right where you see those graphs. Like, you know, like that's science. That's mathematics. That, that's not science. science. In science, we don't use mathematics. In science, we have to explain a physical mechanism. OK, so that graph doesn't tell me anything. What's the issue here? The issue, you see it on the lower left. You see a little galaxy that I put there and you see three red uh, arrows. OK, what am I describing there? Well, as the galaxy turns and we're going to turn it counterclockwise. OK, uh, those stars that I pinpointed there, they should be flying out because there's not enough mass 
in the center of the galaxy to pull on that star. So what have they done? They filled in the blanks with this so-called dark matter. What is dark matter? It's a variable in an equation. And on the uh, lower right, you see how I uh, put their graph. They have a graph where they show that as you get farther away from the center of a galaxy, the speed of stars is approximately the same as those uh, further in. And this violates uh, our intuition because it should be that, you know, stars on the farther side of the galaxy should travel much slower. And that's not the case. They travel just as fast or faster, as you can see on the graph. And so what have they done? They put kilograms all over the place. That's what they did. And these kilograms are put in there by hand. Okay. And so what is a kilogram? I mean, how does a kilogram do it? How does a kilogram pull on another kilogram? We're back to concepts. You can say that this is a mathematical description. You cannot say this is a physical explanation. Okay. I don't see a mechanism there by putting uh, kilograms. All I'm seeing there is that these people are uh, simply describing. Description is not an explanation. In mathematics, they describe. That's all mathematics can do. An equation only is a description of motion. What is uh, physics? An explanation of physical causes and mechanisms. And of course, those two will never meet. That's why mathematical physics is idiocy. You can never put math with physics. You can, they never merge because they're two different disciplines. One deals with numbers. The other one deals with causes and mechanisms. And what they've done is they give you the idea and you're educated to believe through the books that you read in high school you know you start with force equals mass times acceleration uh, force equals g times mass mass divided by distance square you get all these equations and people are lost because you know when you get this for the first time you panic you say oh i don't understand any of that and what are they telling you they're saying look we can tell you how this universe works but that how the word how does not refer to mechanisms what does how refer to how description it's like you know how did the math uh, how did the magician do the trick on the uh on the stage oh i can tell you how he went in there he cut the lady in half in two pieces he he took uh 20 uh strokes right and he did it in 10 seconds well yeah but i mean uh, i was asking how did he do the trick that's what i want to know all he did was describe mathematically what the math what the magician did up there. He has not explained the magic trick. That's the difference between physics and mathematics. Okay, so no, they they never go together, math and physics, and that's that's a big problem that we have today. These people are taking their math, their equations, and trying to make you believe that they understand. By understand, I mean explanation. Uh, mechanisms cause it that they understand how this universe works no they can only describe and they make quite a few errors there of logic especially of, of uh, rationality okay let's continue here uh how do we explain it in the under the rope model very simple uh, all stars are interconnected they're physically interconnected because all atoms are physically interconnected OK, so now we can see why the stars on the outer side of a galaxy don't fly out, because they are physically connected to all other stars and the whole thing tends towards the center of a galaxy. So so uh, a galaxy rotates and all these stars don't fly apart because they're all interconnected. Very simple, baby stuff, kindergarten stuff. All you need to do is make a new assumption. The assumption is all atoms in the universe are interconnected, physically interconnected. You don't attract with mass, you attract with a rope, an elongated object of some kind. You want to put a wire in there, you want to put a cable, fine. But it's got to be an elongated object. It's got to be. There's no other way, okay? You can't explain action at a distance with particles, with discrete particles. Throwing particles or through pressure like the uh, push gravity people do. <laughs> uh, they even do push magnets now. Unbelievable. Okay, um, there's another issue here, and that was the uh, space-time issue. Okay, they raised this, and they said, uh, you know, you have Einstein's model of gravity, which is, of course, theoretically the uh, bending of space and time, okay? So how did uh, Dave answer this? Well, sorry, general relativity is one of the most corroborated theories in the history of science. Again, a lot of authority, a lot of uh, uh, throwing facts around like truth, you know, uh, and, um, and, and there's no explanation. 
And so the model predicts, I love that word predict, uh, the perihelion precession of Mercury with extreme precision. That's upper right there. You see the little uh, rosettas there. Okay, that's, um, that's the perihelion shift. Uh, we can see gravitational lensing all over the universe with magnitudes that align with cumulative masses the light is bending around. Okay, the first problem there is light is bending. Okay, light is bending. I covered that the other day. No, light does not bend. Not if light is made of photons. What the people uh, in mathematics like to use that word bending or warping when they're really saying deflecting. What they're trying to say is the photon is deflected because space is curved, not that light is bent or warped. And, you know, these people uh, have uh, built this irrational language, okay? And, and that's part of the problem, you know, um, that happens, you know, with all these folks. Uh, here's uh, here's uh, my answer to that. I mean, if, if he's right and all these uh, measurements and whatever calculations uh, show what he s says they do, uh, that there is such a thing as space-time, well, then the question is, is time a physical object can be warped by gravity? Does, does Earth... Uh, uh, drag space around is proven supposedly by the gravity uh, probe B experiment. And you see that on the uh, upper right there. Uh, you know, is that what the Earth does? It drags space around itself? Is this what the physical interpretation is? You know, we have to fire everybody at NASA. These people are, are idiots. I mean, uh, really, this is as rational as it gets. And they, they say there's a physical object called space-time when space-time is clearly a, an abstract concept. These people are not doing physics, they're doing abstracism. That's what they're doing. And abstract is the opposite of physical, by the way, okay? So these people are not into physics. They're into a different, uh, uh, you, know, you could say, dimension almost. Okay, there exists an unimaginable physical four-dimensional object called space-time. That's that tesseract that you see there. I mean, uh, you know, this is uh, one of their favorite toys. And what you're seeing there is two nested cubes. But uh, I drew in there uh, the little red lines. I don't know if you can see those very well. I just colored them in. And what I'm showing there is that uh, this thing they call the tesseract is really a movie. What you're looking at is not two nested cubes. What you're staring at is really a cube moving through time, okay, to use that language. And the cube is expanding to become the bigger cube. So those red lines are the trajectories of the edges or the corners of the little cube. What you're staring at is a picture of a movie. That's what a tesseract is, okay? Because otherwise, you know, all you see is two nested cubes. That's three-dimensional uh, put on a two-dimensional platform. That's what you're seeing uh, uh, objectively, okay? Okay, and then we live inside a concept. We live inside space-time. Is that what it is? Uh, we, you know, what is this? Space-time is simply a, a bunch of uh, number lines that the mathematicians use to pinpoint a, a point within space-time. You know, that's what it is. But to say that you live within this concept, mathematical concept, no, this is idiocy. Uh, space-time has nothing to do with physics. And again, uh, you get uh, space-time serving as a wall uh, that prevents the Earth from flying out. Okay, so that's... That's uh, another one that, I don't know, they'll, they'll have to figure out how they're going to answer that one someday. Because, see, we have, to, we have to explain, after all, we do have to explain why the Earth doesn't go flying out of the solar system. And they're going to go with this rigmarole where they have a circular argument. They say, it's space-time, depression in space-time. We have the gravity well. Okay, I understand that. Uh, we're talking about a roulette, right? The little ball going around the roulette. It doesn't fly out. Why? Because there's a wall there, right? It's a circular wall. Okay, we all understand that, uh, the analogy, right? And you see, is that what the Earth is really rolling around space-time, around this concept? I mean, space-time is... You're not supposed to take the analogy literally. Okay, so... Then what does it go around? What was the analogy for? If if the analogy is not an analogy for, I mean, if, if I'm going to say why doesn't the uh, uh, ball fly out of my bowl, I can use as an analogy the roulette and say, look, it's like the roulette. You know, the roulette goes around. Then it's a fair analogy. It's a straightforward analogy. But to say, look, space time works like a roulette. You know, you have this depression. You have the little ball going around. You're saying the Earth is really has a wall there. No, no, you're not supposed to take it literally. <laughs> so what have we learned you know again that's the problem with space time it's a circular argument you know you never get through with that um 
And just uh, to finish off, we'll put some authority uh, to help the uh, people who are rational in this planet. And here we have uh, authority from Leo Susskind. He's a Felix Bloch professor at theoretical physics, Stanford University. Big title. And he says, you and I evolved in a world of three dimensions. We can't visualize more dimensions. I can visualize three dimensions in my head, but I use X, Y, and Z to describe them mathematically. Now I go to four dimensions or five dimensions. I can't visualize them anymore. I can't say, now close your eyes and view in your head five dimensions because I can't do it either. So we're stuck needing mathematics because evolution didn't equip us to be able to visualize quantum mechanics. It didn't equip us to visualize 11 dimensional space time. Evolution did this to us. Now, isn't that a breathtaking answer, a uh, confession? And then you, you talk to a lot of these guys and say uh, to, to uh, you know, people who, who are into, uh, who read the blogs and who read some of the papers, and of course they know. I mean, if relativity were wrong, GPS wouldn't work. <laughs> this is the kind of answer you get, okay? Yeah, GPS doesn't prove that there, that you can bend time, which is what they're saying, essentially, because they say time dilation. Well, what do you mean by time dilation? Well, it means that, you know, gravity can warp time, and, and you know, and then if you're at different heights and so on, so you have gravitational time dilation, you have uh, um, kinetic time dilation. They put all these things in there, and you say, well, hold it. Are you saying that time is a physical object that you can bend? Are we stretching the second? Well, what are you saying? You know, and so this, this is the issue. These people they use a fancy language, and they try to get their uh, points across with this weird language that they've invented. Okay, so finally, let me just put another one because i got to move on here. Uh, this is our dear friend Richard Feynman. He's a Nobel Prize winner of 1965. And he says, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. Do not keep asking yourself if you can possibly avoid it, but uh, how can it be like that? Nobody knows how it can be like that. The more you see how strangely nature behaves, the harder it is to make a model that explains how even the simplest phenomena actually work. So theoretical physics has given up on that. No one is researching uh, physical interpretations. Nobody gives a damn about physical interpretation. So if you're expecting an answer, well, you got a long way. You know, you, you got to wait till the end of the century, uh, uh, maybe the third, uh, th th third millennium century. Okay. Okay. Let's continue here. Um, where does this all take us? Um, what is the problem? Why why do we have all these uh, weird uh, explanations? you might wonder. And uh, why do the flat earthers have this weird interpretation? I also had, you know, a couple people point out that, um, you know, um, I don't make sense either, in their opinion. And they challenged me, they said, look, I, I want to test your ropes. Okay. And so I needed to cover this subject today. And I'm going to extend a little bit today, but I, I, I'm going to cover it, okay? And it goes like this. Uh, let's start with the Flat Earthers. Uh, there's a comment there, and, and not a comment, that's in their website. And it applies to everybody. It really applies to the electric universe, to mainstream. It applies to uh, the John Chapel Society, all these people. Here it is, okay? And uh, so this is not unique to the Flat Earthers. But I thought it was a good way to... Uh, introduce the subject. says, the evidence for a flat earth is derived from many different facets of science and philosophy. The simplest is by relying on one's own senses to discern the true nature of the world around us. Senses telling you that we do not live on a spherical heliocentric world. This is using what's called as em an empirical approach. What is the empirical approach? Empiricism. Knowledge comes only or primarily from sensory experience. Okay, that's what people have, a lot of people have that in their minds. Okay, alternatively, uh, when using Descartes' method of Cartesian doubt, what is that? A systematic process of being skeptical about or doubting the truth of one's belief, of beliefs, okay? So uh, we have these two, the uh, empirical and the Cartesian doubt method. You can also add to this if you want uh, Karl Popper's falsifiability as another criteria. Okay, so these are different ways of tackling uh, problems. Okay, 
And uh, so it takes us to the question, what is science? Is, is, is this what science is? Uh, doubting, uh, testing the hypothesis, uh, using your sensory experience, uh, running an experiment to, you know, confirm the uh, theory or the hypothesis or whatever. Is that what science is about? Well, let's find out. Here uh, we have a definition of science from some very important sources uh, that a lot of people use or that, you know, are, uh, I guess, um, you could say formal. Uh, here's dictionary.com. Uh, this is the definition of science, okay? The intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Wikipedia, a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe. And Berkeley has a checklist where they go, focuses on the natural world, aims to explain the natural world, uses testable ideas, relies on evidence, involves the scientific community, leads to ongoing research, and benefits from scientific behavior. Is this what science is about? And uh, if you ask most people, they probably say, yeah, that's, that's what I've been taught in high school. I'm saying none of that has anything to do with science. And that's the problem today. None of it has anything to do with science. Uh, we never did science in the last 10,000 years. <laughs> what are you saying, Bill? You're crazy? Yeah. Why? Because for the first time, we got a definition in the 21st century of what science is that is consistent, that is rational. And for the first time, we have a scientific method that we can also defined in objective terms. Before that, we never had it, and that's why people come up with all these weird theories, because they think things that it's about testing or, or uh, running an experiment and proving your hypothesis and making predictions and observing and collecting data. None of that has anything to do with science. So let's go through the list of what science is not, according to this site, okay? And again, that has to do with, uh, with uh, some of the followers. You know, uh, people say, I've been following you for two and a half years, someone said the other day, and lately you've changed, you know, you, you change your pitch. And No, no, it's because you don't have the intelligence to figure out what I have been saying. I've been saying the same thing for the last 20 years, but you haven't picked up on it because you're still thinking your old terms and your old... Uh, in the way you were educated in high school, your, your version of science, your notion of what the scientific method is. So I need to go in there and show you exactly what science is not. And I'm going to offend at least 90 to 99% of my audience today. And I hope to do so because I don't want you as followers if, if you don't agree with this stuff. Okay. And uh, followers. Uh, it's like that girl. She's walking in at night. And she's all scared, you know, because she's afraid something, someone's going to do something to her, maybe rape her or kill her or whatever. And she feels some footsteps behind her. Boom, boom, boom. And she walks faster and her footsteps go faster behind her, and faster and faster and faster. And she finally turns around and says, who are you? Who are you? And the guy says, I'm your follower. Well, please don't. And that's the same thing I'm saying. Please don't. Don't follow me. I mean, don't you have anything better to do if, if, if you don't agree or you don't, you know, you don't fall in line with what I'm saying here, you know, if, if, if you have totally different version, any question, any comment you put is, is going to bounce. It's going to bounce because you're not paying attention to what I'm saying. It doesn't mean you have to agree. It just means that you should be aware before you ask the question or make a comment on what this site is about. So let's go through the list of what science is not. And I hope to offend at least 90 to 95% of the people out there. Here it goes, okay? Keep an eye on it, okay? Here it goes. <laughs> okay, what science is not. We do not observe in science. Any person who is observing is a gawker, okay? He just gawks. That's what observe means. Study, we don't study anything. We analyze, we don't analyze anything. We don't predict, we don't make any predictions. That's astrology. Uh, we don't collect data, no data whatsoever. Uh, we don't do any math, no equations, okay? So anyone doing equations is known as an idiot. And he calls himself a uh, scientist? No, he's an idiot, okay? That's what it's called. Uh, anyone who describes, he's also an idiot. We don't describe in science. 
uh, we don't present evidence. Anyone who presents evidence is again an idiot. We treat them. That's that's the by the way that's the scientific the technical term. Okay, anyone who presents evidence, idiot. That's that's how we treat them in in rational science. Uh, we don't do experiments. Anyone who does experiments, we call them an idiot. Who comes and says, "I'm going to do an experiment to show you to demonstrate," we call them an idiot. Okay. So if you think that this is science, now you know what the label what label we're going to apply to you. We don't seek the truth. We don't prove anything. We don't persuade, convince, convert, or recruit. Uh, we don't know or believe. We don't use the word knowledge at all. Knowledge means religion. Means you already know. Okay. Uh, we don't win prizes. You know, uh, they give these prizes, the Wolf Prize, the, uh, uh, what is it, the uh, Nobel Prize. We don't get, you know, that's, that's beauty contest, okay? Uh, the girl walks with her bouquet of flowers, big tears. Oh, I'm the most beautiful in the world. Well, that's what these guys are. They go with their medals. Oh, I got a medal for intelligence. You know, I mean, what the, <laughs> what is this? Is that science? Um, we don't censor theories. Okay, we accept all theories. I'll accept theories from the electric universe, from uh, Eric Dollard, from, um, I don't know, Ken Wheeler. I'll accept theories from them. I want to hear theories. I want to pick my brain. I want to see what I can find wrong with them if they contrast against my theories. And that's how you improve yourself. If I'm going to be bombarded every day with black hole and big bang and dark matter and big bang and dark matter every day over and over and over again, we proved, we found, we, we discovered, we, we measured. Oh, my God. I mean, stop it. No, I want to be, uh, you know, enriched with different theories. So, no, we don't censor theories. We welcome theories and we analyze and we criticize them. That's why it's better to fight and not to hide. That's my point. Uh, we don't rely on authority. Uh, you know, the boss tells you to believe or you believe for me because, you know, I'm too stupid. So I'm going to let you do the thinking for me. You can also sleep for, with my wife for me, you know, uh, and you can also feel for maybe you can die for me. You know, No, you got to do your own thinking. OK, you can't rely on authorities. You got to reason it for yourself. Otherwise, you know, all you're doing is just having your religion in your head, which, which is unsubstantiated because you don't understand your own theory. Uh, we don't vote for theories. Science is not democratic. It's not majority. You know, if everybody votes for the flat earth, it doesn't mean that it makes it so. Mother Nature laughs at those people. Okay. And we don't testify or present witnesses. None of that is science. None of that that you see there has anything to do with science. Have I offended you? I hope so. That was my intention. <laughs> uh, let me make a little more uh, graphic here. Okay. So all these groups, mathematical physics, uh, flat earthers, uh, electric universe, thunderbolts, Ken Wheeler, Eric Dollard, um, includes, including uh, Nikola Tesla, uh, David and Bob Hill, during their uh, John Chapel Society, Nassim Haramein, uh, etherists, uh, Buddhist, Catholic, all these people essentially have this notion of the scientific method. Observe, collect data, hypothesize, predict, run an experiment, verify, describe with math. They use the sense of vision, hearing, smell, taste, or touch. Anyone who uses any of these senses is not a scientist. We, we, we get rid of these people because uh, we don't use the senses. Sorry. Okay, so anyone who uses these senses is, uh, we call them an idiot. Okay, that's why we, we treat them as an idiot, and idiot is a, a term uh, of art. It's a uh, scientific term that says that you need help. That's what it means. Okay? So we got that straight. So uh, what is science? Well, first of all, I got a little picture here. <laughs> and that's, uh, this is the Bill Gates School of uh, Science. Uh, for those of you who know Faulty Towers, uh, we got John Cleese there with Manuel. And he says, please try to understand before one of us dies. And then he goes in there and beats his car with a, a, you know, a little a branch there. And we do the same thing. We beat these guys up. We teach with a baseball bat. That's the only way to get you out of your hypnotism. That's why we teach with a baseball bat. Because people just blab whatever they learned in high school or college. And they're not thinking. They're just repeating what, you know, verbatim, robotically what they, what they learned. Okay, by rote. Okay, so uh, let's see if we can get to what... Uh, Science is, is this the one? I think, let's see if this is the one, yeah. This is what we do in science. We explain, 
That's all we do in science. We explain. Now, you don't find explain on the left-hand side, and that's what we do in science. We only explain. What do we explain? We explain mechanisms. We explain causes. We explain them objectively and rationally. And once we finish with the explanation, science is over with. What continues is religion, belief. Whether you believe that what the guy presented, that's your business. It doesn't concern science. Science is only explanation. And people have a hard time understanding this because they, they all say, well, can you demonstrate this? Can you, can you do an experiment? How can we prove? No, that's all on the left-hand side, in the, the side of idiocy. Okay? In science, we only explain rationally so that you understand what, the mechani what mechanism is being proposed. That's it. That's where science stops. And that's the only way to do object science objectively. Okay? And so this is the big problem. The problem is that people are not explaining, and they're not explaining rationally. Why? Because they're moving concepts around. That's where the irrationality part comes in. They're moving plasma. They're moving waves. Wave is not a physical object. They're moving energy. They're moving fields. None of that applies in physics. You're doing religion. You're doing irration. You're moving spirits. That's all you're doing. You got to move a physical object. You got to tell me what physical object underlies your theory, your, your mechanism, the one that you're proposing. So if you're going to explain, like in this case, two magnets, okay, why they stick together. I, wanna, I want you to put a physical object in between those two magnets or, or on the outside of the two magnets. Somewhere you got to put a physical object. If you're going to tell me, oh, a field did it or the waves did it or, uh, you know, energy did it. No, you're in, the wrong, you're in the wrong business. You should go to church on Sunday and pray for your salvation. Okay. So, yeah, all we do in science is explain. And uh, here we'll compare them side by side, the uh, uh, scientific methods. At the bottom you have, uh, bottom left, you'll see what I showed before, the observe, collect data, that kind of thing. And this is the genuine science, scientific method. Uh, we have to explain a theory to someone. We have to explain a mechanism. And so we start with the assumptions. And assumptions are known as the hypothesis. Hypothesis is not an unproven theory as it is in the religion of mathematics. No, a hypothesis is an assumption. And the assumptions begin with the objects that you're going to use, that you're going to move around. You're going to make a movie of your theory so that we can see it with our own eyes objectively. Uh, we have to have definitions for any crucial word, especially word object. <laughs> and uh, uh, we have, you have to start with the initial scene. you got to set your uh, movie in motion starting with a, um, with a first frame. Okay? There has to be a first frame in your film. And you can't start your uh, movie in the middle of, of, the, um, of the film, okay? You got to start at the beginning. Theory, what is an, a theory? It's an explanation. In physics, it means movie of the causes and mechanisms. Just put a movie on the screen so that I can see your mechanism, what you're proposing. I want to see objects. I want to see shapes on each one of the frames of your film. So you can see uh, we have a different way of doing science, and that's called the rational scientific method. And so, yeah, a lot of people have problems with that because they've been educated to say, oh, no, demonstrate to me. Tell me how you did this or I can tell you the mechanism. But you're asking me to prove it to you, to show you evidence. You want me to twist your arm. I don't do twisting. We don't recruit. We don't try to persuade. I mean, we do that because it's, it's natural in humans to do that. But we need to separate persuading and convincing from explanation. Explanation is objective. I explain a mechanism. You understand it. We adjourn. That's it. That's the end of science. Now we can go out there to, to the bar or to the water cooler, and we can shoot the bull for several hours and say, well, how about this and how about that? What evidence do you have? That, that's extra scientific. Okay? Physics, explanations. Explain the rational mechanism. Now, why do I raise this issue? In part because, you know, some people say, uh, have told me in the past, and it came up again recently. They said, well, Bill, um, you propose ropes. You know, the, here's, here's my version of light, okay? I say it's a torsion along a rope. A torsion wave is the fastest thing on that you can imagine. So it's a little better than the transverse or the uh, longitudinal wave. It beats both by a mile. You know, it just leaves them biting the dust. 
torsion wave is the fastest thing there is. Uh, you can also see that the rope is already uh, structurally built with what we see in the uh, electromagnetic wave. Okay, and I'm talking about a rope. Okay, and now uh, people say, well, okay, Bill, let's let's go to the uh, let's go to the lab. Let's see if we can uh, reproduce what you're saying. Let's take the rope and see if you can we can reproduce gravity. If we can reproduce um, magnetism, if we can reproduce features of light. And that's when you, we bring the baseball bat and just hit them over the head like 10 times, okay? Big lumps. What are these people asking? What are they trying to do? Why is their question irrational? Why is their proposal irrational? It's irrational because light. Have you ever be, tried to touch light? Have you ever tried to touch gravity? Have you ever tried, tried to touch a magnetic field? You'll notice something very funny about them. They're, uh, they're immune to touch. You can't touch it. And you say, hold it. Uh, the magnetic field moves the iron filings around. It moves another magnet from a distance, right? But I can't touch it. You know, I, I go in there and I wave my hand around. I can't feel it. I can't, I can't see it. You know, the only way I can see a magnetic field, for example, is by sprinkling iron filings. I can see there's something there. I don't know what it is, but that's the only way I can pattern it. I don't really see the magnetic field. I say, say there's something there, but I can't touch it. And for some reason, it has this one-way touch. It can touch the magnetic, uh, the, the iron filings, but I can't touch the magnetic field. So what are these bean brains trying to do? They're saying, Bill, take a rope, and let's see if we can simulate all these things. Well, can you see this rope? Do you think you can touch I think I can touch it. Uh, I mean, I know you do, you got to do your own experiment at home, always in the presence of a relativist. Uh, go get a rope and see if you can touch it. Okay? These people are saying that they're going to use something from our three-dimensional world that is made of the ropes, which I'm proposing. Okay? And they want to go into the other world, the world of the invisible, of the untouchable, and they want to simulate with something touchable and seeable. They want to they want to simulate something that is not touchable and not seeable. I mean, even if I were successful, I'd be wrong, because you know, imagine, imagine I, I show you gravity. Okay, and I'm saying, what is gravity? Well, gravity, every atom in the universe is connected to every other atom, okay? So what is a person that's falling from an airplane or a mountain, you know? Uh, why does he approach the uh, center of the Earth faster and faster and faster and faster? Why does he accelerate? Well, because, you know, all the uh, ropes are fanning out. And so the guy says, okay, let's see if you're right. Let's go to the lab and uh, let's see if we can simulate it with ropes. And so he goes in there and he ties a whole bunch of ropes to this thing. And I show him the mechanism, right? So it comes down and the ropes fan out as the thing approaches the floor. And the guy says, oh, but you didn't, you didn't simulate gravity. I didn't simulate gravity. No, you did. Why not? Because I can touch the ropes. And see, I can't touch gravity. So now I turn it around against you. I'm saying... Look, uh, you're asking me to use a tangible, visible object to simulate that which is intangible and invisible. So you are the irrational individual who's asking for something impossible. We cannot simulate in the lab Mother Nature's invisible, untouchable universe. Okay? So uh, let me give you a, a little story. You like storytelling? Okay, I'll tell you a little story. Okay? God comes down to earth. You know, God's all powerful, all knowing, you know. Comes down and he visits Johnny. Hi, Johnny. Who are you? I'm God. Oh, God. I, I, I always believed in you. <laughs> well, there was a time that I think you had doubts, but we'll figure that when you get to the pretty gates, okay? Now, uh, let me tell you why I came here. I came here because next couple days, I'm going to be sending an angel down here. To see you and he's going to talk to you okay okay and and what is an angel well an angel is uh it's a man okay 
and he's got these white uh, swan wings. Got a little uh, plate on his head for holding us. That's what he's going to look like. Oh, okay. And uh, is he going to ring my bell? I mean, should I let him in? Or oh, no, don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, don't worry. Why? Hey, he he's going to come through the wall. What? Yeah, he's going to come through the wall. The, the angel will just go through the wall and meet you in your uh, bedroom. You're, you're, you're putting me on. Yeah. <laughs> you're messing with me. No, no, he's going to come through the wall. He's going to talk to you. Well, what's your problem? Well, can we go to my basement? What do you want to go to the basement for? Well, I want to simulate what, you, what you're telling me. I, I have a hard time believing it. Uh, I've got a dummy there, you know, and I want to put some wings on it and a little plate on his head. I want to see if it goes through the wall. Uh, Johnny, you know, the realm of heaven works a little different than the realm here on earth. Okay? Uh, over there, angels can go through walls because it's a different world. And you cannot simulate the world of heaven with the terrestrial world to which you are used to. Okay? So the issue here is the following. These people say, go with the rope. I want to see how the ropes work. No, we don't go to the lab. What we do in science is we explain so that you understand the mechanism. Try to get that through your thick skulls. A mechanism. We're going to explain a mechanism. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand how Mother Nature runs her shop. And obviously, if she's running it with invisible, intangible things, we cannot simulate that in the lab with three-dimensional things of this earth. But it never dawned on these bean brains. And so they say, well, where's the experiment? Uh, demonstrate to me. And it's these people who don't know the scientific method who request these things because that's how they were brainwashed in high school and college. That's why. That's why we have to change. The scientific method is what's wrong, what's irrational today. We, we have to change the definition of science and what science is supposed to do, what physics is supposed to do, what the scientific method is. And I'm telling you, the scientific method is not about running experiments. It's not about uh, demonstrating, proving, or, uh, you know, convincing and recruiting me to, to persuade me to change my way of thinking. That's all religion. Science is what comes only at the, um, at the conference. Before the conference, you can do anything you want. You want to do an experiment to convince yourself, uh, to prove something to yourself, to see if you can get a better understanding, collect data, use the equations you want, do the experiment that you want. I don't care. Do whatever. Stand on your head. Okay? Knock yourself out. When you come to the conference to do science, all we want is an explanation. We don't want any witnesses. We don't want to say, uh, you to say, I observed. I don't care if you observed and you got. You come to the conference, we want you to explain a mechanism. How do you explain a mechanism? You're going to put it on the screen with objects. We want to see a mechanism with our eyes. You can keep your mouth shut. We're just going to look at the mechanism. We're going to understand it just by watching your movie. Do we go out there later and try to simulate it in the lab? No. You can't simulate invisible, intangible workings of Mother Nature with physical objects of our terrestrial daily life. You got that? <laughs> we will see you on Sunday and hopefully we can continue with this line of thought. I, I uh, had to skip over a lot of stuff, but hopefully you got the main point. We'll see you on Sunday. Bye-bye.